Um, I'm here to talk about the art of starting a, a company, uh, specifically a social robotics company. Um, like Christina said, my background, um, I've been building robots since I was a kid. I've, I've built uh, many different robots. This is just some of the commercial robots we've built. Um, started Sphero in 2010 and Misty Robotics in 2017. Um, it was acquired by Furhat earlier this year. So before I start uh, talking about why to start a social robotics company, I want to talk about why just start a robotics company in general. So a few different reasons, like one is it helps progress robotics. The more robots we can get out into the world, um, we have economy of scale, so we can make these robots cheaper. So if you're developing a sensor for robots, for instance, the more that sensor gets out to other robotics companies, the cost comes down and that enables new things to be done. Um, and it just helps everybody. We can accelerate research. So for instance, at Misty Robotics, we ended up raising $22 million and that helps us fund a large team. And I know research budgets can get quite large as well. Um, and it allows us to take not just uh, prototypes of robots, but it allows us to harden that technology, both on the, the hardware side and the software side. So, you know, Misty can drive off a table and, um, and it, won't, uh, it won't break. Um, we can harden the documentation and, and allow other people to access our products. Um, so that's a good advantage. Um, we can create step function products. So robots like Furhat allow people like everybody on this conference to build um, software on top of those products like for hat. Um, different sensors, you can build uh, sensor products for robots or software services that can allow us not to spend all our time working on those sensors or maybe a piece of say voice recognition, uh, but now, now it allows us to all use the service you're creating um, to really step function the whole industry. And robots can, the more robots we get out into the world, they can help um, people, not just us. We all understand robots, um, but it allows other people to adopt these robots, understand what they can do and understand the future of what they can do. Um, and it is, it is a barrier for people. Like they might be scared of robots, but the more robots in our world that are helping us, um, the more it'll exponentially allow more robots get, to get out. So it can also change lives. So with Sphero, we shipped millions of robots and I would get so many emails and families from kids um, that were just getting into robotics and programming and art and other things um, using the robot. And then later on, later on in the company, I was getting emails from these same families and kids that were now going in into, into engineering and saying how their experience with the products really changed their lives. Of course, with social robots, we have, um, uh, robots that are helping kids with special needs or elderly, um, helping you in retail situations and all different kinds of things. So these robots can really have an impact. And personally, you as a founder, it can be extremely fun. I won't really get into this, but I've had so many incredible opportunities all over the world to meet incredible people and do incredible things um, through the companies I've created. Speci specifically for social robots, I think it really highlights these two because of the human interaction. Yeah, like conceptually people understand how robots, um, you know, work in factories, but because of the human interaction of social robots, um, they can have a much bigger impact on the adoption and, and even more so changing people's lives with things like, you know, again, kids with people or kids with special needs, um, the elderly and, and all of the amazing things that I probably will hear a lot about that in the rest of this conference. So when you start a company, you have to have an idea. That's probably 50% of it. You have to have an idea. So how do you think about an idea? Well, um, what I would recommend is starting with a problem. You may may be working uh, with robots already. It, you may be working in an industry where a social robot um, could be useful. It's helpful to identify what those problems are that people have and then think about the solution with your social robot versus what I've done, 
a couple times. And what many startups do is to start with a solution. You start with your robot or your idea, and then you try to figure out what the problem is for it. And that's quite risky. You end up spending a lot of time throwing a, a lot of stuff against the wall, trying to figure out where your solution can fit into a problem. And sometimes you don't get there. Sometimes it just takes a long time and you burn a lot of money and you get lucky. Um, but it is better if you can start with this, start with the problem, then build your solution. Again, you want to find a problem that people actually have. Sometimes it's easy, easy to make up a problem. Uh, it's not really a hard problem, you know, or a real problem that people have. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time uh, and energy to start a company. So I'd recommend doing something you're passionate about. Um, I think it's in Peter Thiel's book, uh, Zero to One, that he talks about how your solution, if there's already one out there, that it needs to be, you know, 10x better. And that's kind of a made up number, but like, if it's just a little bit better, you know, maybe somebody has told you about an app and, you know, it solved something and they're like, yeah, this is such a better way of doing it, but you don't actually start using that app because you have another way of doing it. And it's just not that much better to make you switch your habits. And it takes, it takes, it has to be a way cheaper or way better uh, experience for people to change their habits. Um, so that's a kind of a general rule. It's got to be a lot better. And then it, you want a big market. Um, if you go after a small market, um, I think uh, Bob Iger uses this, this uh, ex-CEO of Disney uses this, um, uh, this example, like he's, he says, uh, you could build the best trombone oil in the world, but you're only going to sell like a couple cases of it a year, just because people don't use that much trombone oil. And they're, um, so you want to, you want something that's big and you don't, that doesn't mean you have to start big, um, but it means, um, you know, maybe you start with a, a small section of that market, but at least you can grow into something, uh, where there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you need money to start a company. So what we've done, uh, what we did at uh, Sphero, my first company, like I didn't really know anything about starting a company. And we, we got accepted into a startup accelerator called Techstars here in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where I am now. And basically over three or four months, they connect you with mentors, um, people who have started companies, and basically, it's sort of a boot camp for how to start a company. So you learn about product market fit and marketing and legal and um, you know how to build your team and all those different things. Um, so a startup accelerator can be a great way to go. Um, if you're not sure how to start, Techstars and Y Combinator are a couple of the big ones. They have programs all over the world, but there's, there's probably hundreds of other accelerators um, besides these two um, for different, you know, for uh, you know, climate change or fintech or hardware. There's there's ones that really focus on robotics. Um, so that's a great way to go. The team. So I said the idea is probably 50% of starting a company. The other 50% is your team, um, and that's co-founders. So you may have co-founders in your company, and and when you look for those people, you want to find people that complement you. So if you're good at, like me, I'm, I'm really uh, I'm good at the technical side. Um, I would say I'm a technical co-founder. So I want to find something that complements, you know, I just don't want to find another a duplicate of Ian. I want to find maybe somebody that's really good at business or I'm better at the hardware side of technical. So like my co-founder that I would look for is maybe better at the software side and maybe a third co-founder that's, that's good at the business side. And then again, your team, I mean, those first hires uh, are, are so important. You want to find people that are um, missionaries that really believe in your vision for the company, not mercenaries. They're this just there for the paycheck. Um, so having those uh, people that complement you, complement the rest of the team, um, that are missionaries, super important. So one lesson learned um you know i have i have hundreds of lesson learns and mistakes i've made in in my companies uh, but i'll talk about one um it's it's very easy to bite off too much when you're starting a company or thinking about your first product 
And you might have heard about an MVP, the minimal viable product. And, and I've done exactly this. I've built MVPs and usually they kind of look like this. So if I were to build an MVP of a truck, um, this is maybe a, an example of, you know, an MVP of a, of a truck. And it's missing a lot of things, but it works. Like you can, you can drive it and it has a steering wheel and tires and you, you start, you start uh, shipping, selling your MVP out to the world. But you quickly find that you know your customers start driving your truck, and at 20 miles an hour, they're starting to get rocks and bugs in their face. And okay, now you, now you need to fix that problem. They're starting to get get complaints. It's really loud. Uh, the wheels falling off. The door doesn't totally shut. There's a bunch of uh, safety issues, and you get into ver a very reactionary state with your product, where you're just you're trying to. You're trying to fix all these things. And the feedback you're getting is, you know, I'm getting bugs in your face. You're like, I know, I know. I, we didn't have the, we didn't have time to put the windshield on yet. And you're just getting a lot of feedback of things you already know about. So what I like to do and like to think about now is the MLP model, which is minimal lovable product. And some people call it the SLC, the simple, lovable, complete product. Can you take the truck and instead of starting with this truck, can you break it down into smaller pieces? So maybe you build a skateboard and that's a complete product. You could sell millions of, of great skateboards and, and people love it. Like there isn't a, no, it, you know, it's not missing a windshield and things like that. Then, then after you ship that product, you're learning about, you know, your supply chain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, manufacturing, packaging, but it's a simpler product. Now you add a now you add a um, a handle to it, and now it's a razor scooter. Again, a complete great product. Then you iterate. You, now you make a bicycle, and then a motorcycle, and then a car, and then a truck. So when you're starting your company, you know you probably want the truck, but think about is there a way? You know, and it's maybe it's not six steps, but maybe it's two steps, or maybe there's just one step before you get to the truck. You know, whatever the social robot is that you want to build, but think about is there a way I can break this down into a smaller, complete product that people will love that I can get out into the market, start to get some feedback, learn a lot of things, and then iterate on it until I get to the robot uh, or the or the sensor or the software uh, product or whatever it is that you're trying to go to for your startup. So a few different ideas um, for companies that you could start. Um, all companies, I would say, are very challenging to build. Uh, but you may have heard the, the phrase, um, hardware is hard. And that's definitely true. It's, it's hard. It's time consuming. It takes a lot of money um, to build Misty, the little robot uh, up in the right to the left of the fur hat robot. Um, you know, it probably it took us four years and fifteen to twenty million dollars to build that robot. It's more than you think. So software is nice because you can iterate quickly. You can push it out. You can make updates. Um, you don't have to worry about manufacturing and and molds and all that stuff. Um, so think about software companies. You can actually build software on top of robots like Misty and Fur Hat. So these could be platforms. So you can just buy the robot like Fur Hat and you could build, making totally making this up, you could build software to be a, you know, great uh, caretaker for, you know, companion for elderly. And you could sell that solution on top of the Fur Hat robot to, uh, <clears throat> to you know, uh, elder care facilities or just directly to elderly people. Um, and you can stay on the software side, which makes it a lot faster, cheaper to develop your solution to get out into the market. You could also build software um, services. So maybe it's like something around voice recognition or you know, emotion recognition. Those are services that all social robotics companies can use. And that's, again, that can kind of step function the entire industry. And you have to do your homework, right? To figure out if that's actually a problem for companies. Um, and then and then build that solution. Um, you could also build sensors. So in Misty, we had a sensor in the what we called it the visor above the eyes. It's a structure sensor for mapping and navigation, and it 
uh, developed like a depth map of its environment to do that. Uh, but that was a sensor that we just bought uh, from a company. And these sensors are incredibly important and, and they can help us just plug in functionality to our robots when you're building the entire robot. You know, we, we need more companies building these pieces that we need to build a complete robot. So lots of opportunities there. And lastly, you know, a complete robot. This is this is a screenshot from the root uh, the movie Robot and Frank. Um, you know, I would say if you do your uh, your problem research, you're going to find that probably an arm wrestling robot is probably the not the best uh, not the best idea for for your social robot. Um, but there is there's tons of opportunities out there for for robots um, that interact with people or help people in different ways. Um, and you can build a whole robot. And as long as you understand, it's just a, it's a much bigger uh, it's a much bigger challenge. But but it's uh, it's not impossible. There's there's Furhat, there's Misty, there's tons of other companies building entire robots. Um, and we need we need more robots out there. We need more social robots. So this was super quick. I could talk about stories all day long. Um, I'm really excited to see you know, the other social robot work that people are doing at the rest of this conference. Um, I hope this have, has gotten you thinking a little bit about, you know, if you're just thinking about robots, like how do we, how could you create a company around this? Or if you're doing research and you have a, a robot you're already working on, I hope this got you thinking a little bit about how do I potentially commercialize this, take it outside of the lab uh, and get it out to the world and get people using this in their, their homes and businesses or wherever. So thank you very much.